Why don't we just start off with the um, kind of the near-term outlook, um, your base case scenario for uh, what's likely to happen uh, for the Canadian economy over the next 12 to 24 months. Half glass full or half glass empty? Why don't we start with you, Leslie? Thank you, uh, and uh, thank you for having me here today. I uh, always enjoy my time in the city. Um, so uh, we're uh, glass half full, <laughs> as, we, uh, as we talked about er earlier this morning. Um, in, in Canada, uh, I think the backdrop is quite positive uh, for the economy. We have very uh, low unemployment, um, although we saw an uptick in our inflation numbers uh, yesterday. I don't think that we have any major concerns about inflation. Um, interest rates are low, which encourages uh, investment. And uh, we have a very stable environment uh, just the general backdrop for our economy. Our economy is not growing as fast as our neighbors south of the border, um, but still in that one and a half to two percent range, we would describe that as moderate growth, and that creates. Um, we're back to the Goldilocks environment that we were talking about probably 12 months ago before we saw the volatility in 2018 uh, for Canadian investors. Jean Francois. We're certainly glass half full, maybe kind of glass three quarters full. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot of things that are going well for the country. That's not kind of evident from perhaps the investor perspective. But you look at, for instance, for first quarter growth, which was disappointing in some fronts. But underlying that, domestic demand was on fire. So the consumer is coming back in Canada. The real estate side seems to be coming back. Businesses are investing. In fact pretty strong investment growth and business intentions for capital spending are equally strong for this year. Um, the job market is on fire, continues to be on fire. Wage growth is picking up a little bit, although still a little bit weak. Um, and as you, as you kind of think about the outlook for the remainder of the year, so you're coming off a weak first quarter, um, relative to a strong first quarter in the US, US is transitioning to slower growth, we're transitioning to higher growth. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a different growth dynamic in Canada versus the US. Uh, and one which we think is, is reasonably sustainable. Um, you know, we're benefiting from high, high oil prices. And, and, and the only thing really that troubles us in Canada is what's, it's what's happening down south. Uh, well, I guess not down south from here, but um, in, in the US uh, on the trade front. And, and the extent to which that goes in a favorable or unfavorable dimension has the potential to significantly shift the Canadian outlook. But if you look at fundamental drivers of Canadian growth from a purely Canadian perspective, it, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic at this point. But if if uh, we see a, a dramatic uh, slowdown in the U.S. economy, even a recession, is there any, there's no way the Canadian economy could not follow suit, could it not? I mean, if, do you, so you don't, uh, uh, you don't believe that we're going to see a major slowdown in the U.S., is that correct? At this point in time, uh, we don't anticipate that. So we've got growth in the U.S. of about two and a quarter, slightly more than that. Um, that's on the assumption that the summit goes reasonably well at the end of the month, which is to say that Trump and, and the Chinese um, you know, have a reasonably constructive uh, dialogue. If we're in a world where the trade war amplifies, um, then you're looking at a significantly weaker U.S. and, of course, a significantly weaker Canada, significantly weaker rest of the world as well. I, I think there's, there's, um, there's no incentive for... Uh, the U.S. to enter into a major global trade war heading into an election year uh, next year. Um, so the likelihood of a trade war which could cause a recession in the U.S. is a low probability scenario in, in, in our view. Um, but I think you're right that under this scenario where the U.S. entered a recession, it is likely that Canada would get dragged into that as well. I mean, Canada is obviously a very important partner to the U.S. A large part of our GDP is dependent approximately 20 percent on uh, U.S. growth. So obviously we're very intertwined with the outlook for the U.S. We are not suggesting in our outlook that the next 12 months means a recession in Canada or in the U.S. Um, but the Fed uh, looks like it's going to be moving. I mean, they certainly opened the door uh, yesterday to move as early as next month. Uh, I don't know if that's your base case scenario uh, uh, for a Fed rate cut this year um, or not. But uh, I guess the question is, um, if the uh, Federal Reserve uh, does go um, and looks like it's, it's going, um, what scope does the Bank of Canada have? Well, what does it mean for Canada? Does the Bank of Canada, for example, have scope to, you know, buck the easing trend or 
Uh, how do you see that playing out uh, for uh, the Canadian economy and Canadian assets? <laughs> So I think that that's an important factor to consider. We shouldn't assume that just because the Federal Reserve is going to move that the Bank of Canada will also move. Um, the Federal Reserve has more room to move. They increase rates more than we did in Canada. I think directionally, if the Fed cuts rates, Canada will, but perhaps not at the same pace. So you could see an, what we would call an insurance rate cut in July, where you see the Fed move and they move to a wait and see. Obviously, the market is pricing in 50 basis points of rate cuts this year, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that. That, that could change also. Uh, the Bank of Canada has said that they will be data driven and their focus is really on three things. One being uh, the Canadian consumer and how the Canadian consumer is responding. And we've talked about already today how uh, retail sales have been quite strong, unemployment is low. So we think the Canadian consumer is not going to give the Bank of Canada motivation to move on rates. The second is the global trade file. Uh, again, global trade has created volatility and uncertainty, particularly for businesses in their announcements around uh, business investment. So that's potentially uh, justification for the Bank of Canada moving. And the third being oil prices. And obviously oil prices over the last six months have been extremely volatile and very difficult uh, even for the experts to predict the, the outlook for oil. So if you saw a major correction in oil prices, we've seen the Bank of Canada move in response to oil prices in the past, you could see the Bank of Canada move. Now the real question is, um, does uh, what is the bank focused on when it thinks about moving rates and, and really um, the concern is about housing and it just in general consumer indebtedness. So the Bank of Canada has room to wait and see. There's really no incentive at this point in time where they feel like they have to move in sync with the Fed. I just maybe add a couple of things to that. Um, one is kind of the, the Bank Canada's mandate relative to the Fed's mandate. So the Fed's got a dual mandate, inflation and, and eventually maximum growth or maximum employment. Bank Canada targets inflation. That's its own, in principle, it's its only consideration. The governor talks about household indebtedness and financial stability considerations, but by law, the Bank Canada sets policy to achieve 2% inflation. Um, so when you compare Canadian inflation to U.S. inflation, Canadian inflation is on target. It's a two. In fact, the data that came out yesterday suggests it's just slightly above two, if you look at the average of the core measures. Um, that's certainly not the case in the U.S. You know, in the U.S., inflation is moving away from its target pretty fast. In Canada, it's been there for a while. So as a, as a kind of conditioning factor for how the Bank of Canada might approach, say, Fed easing, I, mean, I think you've got to keep that in mind, that you know, inflation is basically where the bank wants it to be. Um, the second consideration is to try and figure out what is driving the Fed cut, if in fact it does cut. So if the Fed is largely driven by um, weakness in inflation, which is how largely how some people have been thinking about it over the last few months, you know, that's not an environment where the bank head would be likely to fall. You know, it's the Fed responding to domestic uh, concerns, namely inflation, wants to bring inflation up. Arguably, that's good for Canada. If the Fed is seen to be more driven or is more driven by global trade developments, as Powell indicated uh, he was watching very closely yesterday, that's a bit of a different story. Um, the challenge then becomes for the governor of the Bank of Canada, who has indicated many, many, many times that he is basically entirely data dependent. Uh, so he's not particularly forward looking in his analysis. He can't be, there's too much uncertainty. So he's going to set policy on the basis of things that he observes. If that's the case, um, then he's got the challenge of, you know, the trade situation deteriorates. Um, he's combining that with reasonably strong domestic demand data in Canada. How does he? How does he? How does that all compute in, in his way of thinking about it? And then at this point in time, we just, um, you know, think that he's more likely to stand pat, or Bank Canada is more likely to stand pat in the face of a Fed cut than, than um, I think markets have got priced in at this point. This all sounds bullish for the Canadian dollar. Is that how are you, uh, do you see the Canadian dollar kind of rising um, as kind of these dynamics play out? Well, there's, there's two dimensions and, and um, 
One is uh, the central bank policy and the impact on, on the Canadian dollar, but in, in Canada, obviously, oil prices also have an impact on the outlook for the Canadian dollar. So you could have two competing forces which suppress the Canadian dollar, but I think also, um, I don't think it should be lost on anyone that even though there are central bank cuts both priced in, in the US rate outlook or picture as well as in, in Canada, um, to the extent that we're already pricing in that differential um, where we think that the Fed will move further than the Bank of Canada, if at all, um, that, that a lot of that is already priced into what we've seen in the Canadian dollar. I would just add maybe a couple of things to that. So, um, you know, the Canadian dollar is one of these currencies that's remarkably easy to model historically. So you can, you can, you can figure out its drivers pretty clearly statistically, and they're, ba they're basically oil prices, commodity prices, interest rate differentials. And then there's kind of this third general term, which are basically shifts in international risk preferences. So movements in and out of the US dollar, kind of mass movements in and out of risk preferences. Um, you know, using so because you can model it reasonably well, you can get a pretty good sense of where the dollar tracks relative to fundamentals. And right now, on the basis of the evolution of oil prices over the last six months, on the basis of uh, the evolution in kind of U.S.-Canada spreads, you know, we think the Canadian dollar is um, undervalued by three to five cents. Um, so we do think there's room for the Canadian dollar to appreciate. The challenge is, and we would have thought this for much of last year as well, and that obviously last year that didn't happen. The challenge is, um, relates, again, largely to uh, Trump policies. So even though Trump wants a weaker dollar, he's pretty clear about wanting a weaker US dollar, the reality is his policies create uncertainty, and that uncertainty leads to safe haven flows into the US, so you get upward pressure on the US dollar um, that kind of has the ability to swamp broader fundamentals, so the impact of oil prices and, and, and rate differentials in Canada. And based on what we're seeing this year, um, even if the Fed cuts. You know, the reality is that the Fed might cut because Trump is creating a lot of uncertainty. So how that works out in kind of US dollar space in terms of, um, in terms of uh, you know, appetite for non-US dollar assets and how that feeds into the Canadian dollar it remains to be seen. But if you look at it on the basis of pure fundamentals, I mean, we do think there's a case for uh, the Canadian dollar to appreciate through the next couple of years. Um, I'd, I'd like to take the conversation a little bit more into uh, uh, longer term um, outlook um, uh, issues. Um, you know, let's assume we don't, uh, um, you know, uh, have a recession or some type of global recession over the next 12 months. Uh, and let's assume that, it, that we don't we don't enter into a world of uh, global monetary, um, an era of uh, further global monetary easing. Um, what is the the bigger the the the, the meta narrative for the Canadian economy. What's the, the long-term investment story for Canada? What makes Canada unique as an as a as an economic story? Um, I guess I'll start. Um, I, I think the the transition uh, of when, when you think when you reflect on history and and people's view that Canada is. Um, a resource-based economy, I think, isn't lost on the government and, and on thinking about policy for the future. So a few weeks ago, there was an announcement that uh, $250 million would be invested in venture capital in um, what we would call more traditional industries, resource-based industries, in order to modernize those industries. Um, so this is through the Business Development Bank of Canada. So I think initiatives like that show uh, that the government is really thinking about how we need to transition. Um, when you look, when you compare our economy to that south of the border, which is a much more, it, granted it's a much more internally based economy, but a service based economy, and it's really transitioned well into that intangible world through the growth of intellectual property. And in Canada, um, for all the reasons already outlined today, we have um, a very highly skilled population. We have generally political stability when compared on um, the global scale, even, even though we have an election coming. Um, we, we have a lot of structural advantages. We have an immigration policy which really focuses on adding skilled uh, labor to our workforce in order to fill unmet needs. So there's a lot of policy that's helping us transition away from this perspective of a resource. And primarily 
primarily carbon-based uh, economy historically. So I think that the, the future for Canada really sits on a lot of the foundational aspects that have already been built. I should also mention, given that we both come from um, the financial sector, uh, a strong and stable financial system as well. So a lot of the positive attributes will allow us to gravitate towards um, that next generation economy, uh, the role of artificial intelligence. Uh, by way of example, Canada is certainly viewed as a center of excellence on, on that front. So I think we need to continue on the path that we're on and potentially move at a quicker pace in order to move into that transitional, more service sector economy than we have been in, in the past to come away from that resource dependency. I mean, I largely agree with that. I, I would, you know, take it back to kind of Econ 101 um, and, you know, think about the economy in terms of kind of production functions. So what it takes to make an economy grow, and, and, and there, are two, there are two factors. There's labor and there's capital. On the labor side, we have, as Leslie indicated, um, you know, very, very advantageous immigration policies uh, to the point where our population growth is exploding in Canada. You know, we are taking a percentage point of population, percentage point of our population immigrants every year. 80 or 90 percent of those are employed. Um, our population growth, for instance, is, is almost three times as high as in the U.S. now. Um, and you cannot underestimate the impact that population growth has on an economy's uh, ability to generate growth. Uh, it's very, very powerful. It's, in fact, one of the reasons our housing market has been as strong as it is, as resilient as, as it was. Um, and that's doubly important in, in, in the world where, uh, as Leslie indicated, you know, it's an economy, Canada's an economy that's trying to transition away, or actually has transitioned away from kind of the natural resource sector to, to, to the services industries or the more creative industries, um, largely because to compete globally in that world, you need to be able to attract the best and the brightest minds. Um, and, and Canada has largely been able to do that over the last year. I mean, there's all kinds of statistics on that, in part, because of American policies and, and kind of the short-sightedness of American immigration policies, which has made America uh, historically kind of the largest, the most interesting market for immigrants um, to become a much less uh, appealing place, and, and places like Canada benefit from that. So as a result, you're having kind of this, 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 this brainwave uh, moving into the country, um, and the population dimension combined with the kind of the skill nature of the labor we're getting, you know, we basically call human stimulus. It's just this, this boost to growth that's going to be long lasting. It's going to continue for, for quite a few years. So there's that that's the labor side is, is doing well. Um, obviously the capital side has been a bit more of an issue in Canada. So business investment growth has been reasonably weak. It's starting to pick up. Um, but interestingly, what we're seeing is, uh, we saw that last year very clearly, um, foreign direct investment in the country is picking up very significantly. And obviously, it's not, it wasn't happening in the oil and gas industry last year, which is historically where it's been in Canada. Uh, it's been pretty broad-based, but also you know, focused to some degree in the tech sector, which is, which is you know, a shining star in Canada. You know, there's a statistics, and we talked about this a little while ago, Theo. There was an article in The Economist, I forget, a few months ago now, um, that you know, put the Canadian tech sector in perspective. So in Toronto, between 2015 and 17, and it's only accelerated since then, there were more tech sector jobs created in Toronto than there were in San Francisco, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. combined. So it's a very, very, very active part of our economy that benefits tremendously from the immigration policy and from other things the government's doing. So we think there's, there's a lot of reason for optimism on that front. In a world where we're transitioning away from, from oil and gas, but also in a world where oil and gas remains important, because we've got the LNG project happening, TMX may or may not there's reason to be more optimistic now than a couple of days ago. Um, we'll see how that works out. But you know, there, there are things happening on the oil and gas side in any event that are you know, pretty good from a longer term growth perspective as well. But there uh, are a lot of bears out there on Canada. There's no denying that. Um, they focus largely on the, the, the debt, uh, high household debt levels in Canada, which they see as uh, both a constraint, a constraint on, on growth, but also as a financial stability risk as well. Uh, and they focus on productivity, uh, which is uh, definitely uh, very slow in Canada. Uh, I mean, Canada's population is growing uh, more quickly than the US. The US productivity is growing more quickly than, um, than Canada. 
and you know, and then that leads them to concerns about um, about competitiveness and all this. These concerns that uh, these um, these uh, bears uh, keep on raising. So, I mean, what are the bears getting wrong then, in your opinion, uh, when they talk about household debt, when they talk about productivity, competitiveness? Are they? Is it a, just an emphasis thing? Like, what are the bears getting wrong? So. I mean, I don't think the bears are getting it wrong in the context of looking at the facts. Um, but what we try and do is take what is the fact and, and what's related to history and say, well, what does the future hold? And the, the indebtedness one is, is, is sort of um, the, the one that probably comes up to, to the top of the pile, um, particularly in a market where housing has been quite strong. And so what we do is go back to that um, loan to value statistic and how exposed, I mean, we have a very heavy concentration in our, our banking sector, obviously. Um, and so when you look, so you can get statistics on loan to value pretty easily uh, for the Canadian market. And still, it's overall a fairly healthy situation. I think the overall loan to value in the housing book in Canada is about 60%. So, I mean, when people think about the the indebtedness, they're really focused on housing, but it's it's less of an issue in, in Canada, and our financial structure um, also supports uh, the future growth of healthy uh, debt and, and leverage. Um, also, it's a low interest rate environment, so supporting that debt level is not really all that challenging o overall. So people like to focus on that one statistic. So I think that's something where there is some factual evidence to support indebtedness of Canadians, but it's, is, is that a real risk? So you have the fact, but how does that play out in, into the future? And we don't view that as um, a huge risk. I think that um, the uh, Canadian um, view or, or, or this view that, that Canada is not open for investment, that Canada is not competitive because of our um, comparative tax regime when you compare us to, to the U.S., particularly post-fiscal uh, reform in, in the U.S., are other things that people like to uh, talk about when, when they're bearish on Canada, but um, with a change of government, you could see a change in, in the future. So again, I think that is definitely backward looking, and I think that we're optimistic that you could see a change. Um, even, even with the current government, fiscal spend has definitely uh, come into play in, in an election year. So I think that infrastructure uh, spending or an investment uh, will be key for the current government. And if we continue with the current government or if we have, have a change in government, you're going to see a lot more infrastructure investment, and that will help to boost productivity. So the uh, future for immigration boosting productivity and infrastructure investment, um, I think, will also put to bed some of the concerns around productivity. I mean, I'd I, I focus a little bit on, that, on the housing market sector. I know you're going to talk about that a little bit later on as well. but. Um, you know, the typical kind of bearish case is the housing market's going to collapse and Canadian banks are super exposed, so you short Canadian banks for Canadian dollars in the financial crisis and blah, blah, blah. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but that's generally how the story goes. Um, but, you know, building on a couple of things Leslie said, you know, when folks look at indebtedness in Canada, they focus exclusively on, on the liability side of the balance sheet. Um, when you look at net worth of Canadians, actually asset growth has been stronger than debt growth. Um, so net worth in Canada is it's not quite at historical highs, but it's, 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 it's extremely high relative to history. Um, so generally speaking, household balance sheets are much cleaner um, than one would infer based on simply looking at, at liabilities. Um, and then you, uh, look, you can look at things like default rates on mortgages. So if you're worried about the Canadian housing market, if you're worried about households' abilities to service debt, if you're worried about you know, homes being too unaffordable and not cascading and creating all kinds of problems, um, then that's the kind of thing that would be picked up in, in, in um, default rates on mortgages in a raising rate environment, which is what we've seen in Canada for the last couple of years. Default rates on mortgages have generally been falling. They're basically at historical lows. Um, so there's no evidence yet that you know this case that folks will make that the Canadian households are, are over indebted, overextended, um, you know, kind of run out of room. It's, it, we're just not seeing that in data yet. Doesn't mean it won't come. Um, it's less likely to come in an environment where rates don't go up anymore. Um, but that's you know that's kind of the reality. And then you layer in on top of that um, on on the kind of the housing market case, which I think is something that's not properly uh, 
internalized by um, <coughs> investors, Canadian or otherwise for that matter, um, is this issue of population growth. I mean, the reality is that for most Canadian cities, this is true in Toronto and Vancouver as well, the market remains undersupplied by and large. Inventory levels are pretty low by historical standards. Um, so there has been no oversupply. There isn't, you know, there isn't kind of this, 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 this trigger out there that is going to see very significant adjustment in, in broad-based home prices. You're seeing, obviously, an adjustment in single-family home space in Toronto and Vancouver, because those, market, those segments are quite unaffordable, but folks are moving down market, and they're, and they're you know, doing what they would do in London, for instance. They're renting more, they're getting flats, they're getting smaller places. It's an adjustment that has to happen in Canada. Um, but by and large, you know, the, 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 you know, the housing market fundamentals remain reasonably strong. You know, it's, it's essentially an issue of supply and demand, right? If you've got a million households living in an area, you need a million places for them to stay. And so far, for much of the country, that hasn't, you know, that we haven't built enough. And that to me is kind of the, that's the, the more interesting cases the bears have made is the focus on the housing sector, the feedbacks to the banks, and, and we, just, we just don't see it on the basis of kind of fundamentals and what's happened with consumers so far. All right, quick, we've got a couple of minutes. Just uh, uh, quickly, uh, we have elections in October, October, federal elections in October. The, you know, the outcome is uncertain, more uncertain than we would have thought five or six months ago. Is there any political risk for the Canadian economy um, following the, from the October election? Well, <laughs> the, the, today, uh, or yesterday when I last checked, the polls are still showing the Conservatives in the lead, but without prospect for a majority government. So I think that the, the risk exists uh, in a minority situation, that then you end up with a coalition with the Liberals and the NDP, and um, that could create some uncertainty. At, at the end of the day, um, the platform of our parties is... Uh, I, I would say, in, in general, still to be defined. Um, there really hasn't been a lot of information on, on what exactly the, the parties are running on, uh, especially comparing two parties that have generally been quite close in their platform, the Conservatives and the Liberals. So I think, I think the risk, for, for me anyway, uh, remains to be seen. Um, but I, I would say that the view, uh, certainly on Bay Street and in Toronto, is that the Conservative government will be a much more pro-investment government than we've seen with the Liberals. And so that should really create more optimism around the outlook for the Canadian economy and Canadian stock market by extension, particularly in, in the oil and gas sector, which has really just been hammered uh, despite the strength in, in oil prices that we've seen over, over the last well, a few months before the last month when oil corrected. So I think generally uh, optimism, uh, a little bit of risk, but n nothing material compared to, I think, what's going to consume everyone, which is the election south of the border. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think, I think the, the only worry one would have in the current environment, and the only way you can get a change in government that would significantly affect prospects in the short run is if, say, the Conservatives come in and they decide they're going to slam the brakes on the fiscal side and shrink the deficit very dramatically. They said they're not going to do that. Um, so, you know, realistically speaking, from a conjunctural perspective, the next 18 months to two years, you know, you're probably going to see fiscal policy. It's not all that different, irrespective of which government you're, you're, you're is taking over. So in that case, kind of the, the fiscal impulse is likely to remain reasonably similar. And, you know, that to us is, is arguably kind of the, the most important thing at this point in time in terms of stability, that you're not, the government's not going to come in and just slam on the brakes. All right. Yeah. So, Leslie, JF, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.